The full examination of this question is the subject of the present treatise, and therefore we shall here content ourselves with establishing one general proposition, that all our simple ideas in their first appearance are derived from simple impressions which are correspondent to them and which they exactly represent. In seeking for phenomena to prove this proposition, I find only those of two kinds, but in each kind the phenomena are obvious, numerous, and conclusive. I first make myself certain by a new review of what I have already asserted, that every simple impression is attended with a correspondent idea, and every simple idea with a correspondent impression. From this constant conjunction of resembling perceptions, I immediately conclude that there is a great connection betwixt our correspondent impressions and ideas, and that the existence of the one has a considerable influence upon that of the other. Such a constant conjunction, in such an infinite number of instances, can never arise from chance but clearly proves a dependence of the impressions on the ideas or of the ideas on the impressions. That I may know on which side this dependence lies, I consider the order of their first appearance and find by constant experience that the simple impressions always take the precedence of their correspondent ideas, but never appear in the contrary order. To give a child an idea of scarlet or orange, of sweet or bitter, I present the objects, or in other words, convey to him these impressions, but proceed not so absurdly as to endeavor to produce the impressions by exciting the ideas. Our ideas upon their appearance produce not their correspondent impressions, nor Good point, actually. I haven't thought of that in that way before. You and but it goes along with what I just said in the previous part that, and he's getting slowly there. So it, it, I just love that you know when when your own you can you know your own philosophy is mirrored in somebody else here, right? It's sort of I I haven't read all these details. I have read some of it, but it's not something I sort of can remember. Uh, only part, partly, but um, this one uh, is uh, clear to me now, more clear to me, that, and it, it goes along with what I'm saying also, that he says, if if you want to understand the sweetness of a banana, you don't say, think of the sweetness of banana. You will give them the banana, so they can taste the sweetness, right? That's I mean, it's it's a freaking obvious, right? So of course you have to have the impression before you can have the idea, right? And the the impression is responsible for the idea. At least that's how I would say it, right? Now, he is not, in my opinion, clear enough and distinguishing between qualia, as we call it now, the 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 sweetness, the bitterness, and so on and the objects which is sort of elephant or banana right these are different banana is not of the same kind as a color or sound right but there are connections but he clearly states i'm going to elaborate on this shit here right and be patient with me let me <laughs> clarify so i don't i don't want to break in uh, too often here i'm just you know i'm i'm sort of i like that i am still in concordance with what Hume says, right? Not necessarily I have to, and when I'm, when I'm not, or if I'm not, I, I will say so, right? And I will sort of try to clarify why, right? But there are possibly various aspects that I have come to in my philosophy, and because he is along the so same lines as me, I, th there will be some overlapping where I've I will see something that he came to that I all also came to, but we did it on on our each our own paths, right? Or by our own accord. And but it's it's nice to feel that at least there's somebody out there who actually understands this kind of approach, 
which I think is the only right approach to philosophy, in my opinion. Uh, in my opinion, right? Okay. Do we perceive any color or feel any sensation merely upon thinking of them? On the other hand, we find that any impression either of the mind or body is constantly followed by an idea which resembles it and is only different in the degrees of force and liveliness. The constant conjunction of our resembling perceptions is a convincing proof that the one are the causes of the other. And this priority of the impressions is an equal proof that our impressions are the causes of our ideas, not our ideas of yes. our impressions. Yes. God damn to it, right? Perfect. Perfect. It's, it's completely, as I said, right? It's, uh, and it's so basic. I mean, even a child would be able to understand this, right? If they haven't been screwed around with by their parents or some other idiots, right? This is sort of this child play, this kind of philosophy. It's so simple. I mean, you don't need all this academic, high-flying cloud castle bullshit, right? I mean... This is, you know, it's, it's down to earth simplicity, in my opinion. To confirm this, I consider another plain and convincing phenomenon, which is that wherever by any accident the faculties which give rise to any impressions are obstructed in their operations, as when one is born blind or deaf, not only the impressions are lost, but also their correspondent ideas, so that there never appear in the mind the least traces of either of them. All right. Mm-hmm. Wherever any accident, by any accident, and the faculties would give rise to the impression, those are the correlations as talked about by nose and eye and ear and so on. That these are the faculties, the faculty, or this. You could maybe maybe a faculty is actually a better word than a sense, right? Because that's sort of kind of fluffy, you know. It, it sense is used in, but you know maybe faculty is also used in it, but. Your a faculty is something that facilitates, for instance, color, right? That's a faculty. That a faculty would be the eye. And he says, yeah, if if you are blind, you will neither have. Oh, so he said, one is born blind or deaf. Not only the impressions are lost, but also their correspondent ideas. So in this sense, I think. I'm, you know, I'm, I have never been deaf, right? I have never been blind. So, and I, I don't, I, I might have to look this up, right? This is sort of an interesting kind of sort of cognitive thing, right? And maybe this is one of these aspects that uh, gives rise to calling this sort of a, a, the first real step, uh, first, you know, next level in, in cognitive science or cognitive philosophy. And sort of some various uh, inquiries into these kinds of aspects, asking a blind person, you know, you you have a color. No, you can't have a color because you can't see, and therefore you don't have the idea of the color either. You can't imagine. Yes, I guess, but but you have to would have to ask a blind or deaf, right? Maybe you couldn't. You could ask using <laughs> deaf and blind. <laughs> All right, enough of that shit. If a person is blind, they neither have the ability to have the impression of red, or they can not either have the idea of red. And I would be, it would be interesting to ask a blind person or a deaf person in, in the same manner, if they have any kind of idea of that, and if they, if they have sort of, if you could force yourself maybe, right? Maybe there's some part of the brain you're born with genetically that gives you ability to give some idea of color but you can never if you're blind you can never know or get to i hesitate using the term no right you can never get to whether that is actually a good idea of that particular color right because you you can never have the impression so that's actually an interesting thought 
this guy is freaking brilliant, right? He is so brilliant. And I mean, it's it's not it's not brilliance, maybe, right? It's just common, you know, structure thinking, right? <laughs> But it would be interesting to, to ask a blind person, right? So if you know, know any blind person out there, please ask and, and let me know, right? Um, but it, it's, it seems reasonable to say that if you are blind, you neither have the impression of red, obviously, but you, you don't have any idea of red either because you never had the impression. So the impression would somehow, in the early days of your mind, be responsible for you having the idea of red, right? Okay. Nor is this only true where the organs of sensation are entirely destroyed, but likewise where they have never been put in action to produce a particular impression. We cannot form to ourselves a just idea of the taste of a pineapple without having actually tasted it no 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 we have to have tasted a pineapple to have an idea of what it tastes what it tastes like and you know you can also say whether you like the taste or not or whether or not you would buy right would like to have the taste at another point in time in the future sort of right um so that might be you, you you can have an idea of the the qualia to connect between desires and the taste and checking up on the taste in a, an empirical matter whether or not this not only looks like a pineapple it actually tastes like a pineapple and if it tastes like a pineapple it's a quite unique idea you could say right a qualia uh, and it's probably a pineapple, right? So. There is, however, one contradictory phenomenon which may prove that it is not absolutely impossible for ideas to go before their correspondent impressions. I believe it will readily be allowed that the several distinct ideas of colors which enter by the eyes or those of sounds which are conveyed by the hearing are really different from each other, though at the same time resembling. Now, if this be true of different colors, it must be no less so of the different shades of the same color, that each of them produces a distinct idea independent of the rest. For if this should be denied, it is possible by the continual gradation of shades to run a color insensibly into what is most remote from it. And if you will not allow any of the means to be different, you cannot without absurdity deny the extremes to be the same. Suppose, therefore, a person to have enjoyed his sight for 30 years and to have become perfectly well acquainted with colors of all kinds, excepting one particular shade of blue, for instance, which it never has been his fortune to meet with. Let all the different shades of that color, except that single one, be placed before him, descending gradually from the deepest to the lightest. It is plain that he will perceive a blank where that shade is wanting and will be sensible that there is a greater distance in that place betwixt the contiguous colors than in any other. Now I ask whether it is possible for him from his own imagination to supply this deficiency and raise up to himself the idea of that particular shade though it had never been conveyed to him by his senses. I believe there are few, but will be of opinion, that he can. And this may serve as a proof that the simple ideas are not always derived from the correspondent impressions, though the instance is so particular and singular that it is scarce worth our observing, and does not merit that for it alone we should alter our general maxim. But besides the... That's an interesting thought. If they're sort of 
50 shades of gray, right? If there are thousands of shades of blue, do you have to have had an impression of thousand shades of blue? Now, it's, it's the problem whether or not you understand the shade as something that the mind creates or it arrives to your mind, right? So if, if it doesn't, the, the shade doesn't arrive, whatever gives the shade is just whatever aspect of that which gifts the shade has. It is sort of, the shade is the shade. That we, if, if, if you think that there's a complete, you know, you can make this uh, wheel of colors. I don't, I don't remember what it's called, but you know, yellow, red, green, blue, whatever, you know. Um, maybe that's just, you know, what, what I can do, right? So whatever shades I have, even if I find them to be complete, there might be hell of a lot of more shades of whatever it's trying to describe. But I'm only having the shades I need in order to do whatever I need to do with the shades. So the shades are mental gradu graduations. This is me carrying on from Hume, right? That the graduations are created by your mind. They don't arrive from the outside. I'm still uncertain or, 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 or doubtful about how he understands the inside-outside dichotomy. But I hope, I hope we will get to it somehow because it's rumored that uh, Immanuel Kant became an idealist when he read Hume. I might be paraphrasing, I might have misunderstood something, but at least it's well known that Kant stated that Hume turned his understanding upside down, right? Inside out or, you know, however you want to put it. And to the best of my understanding, that would be the, um, the, the, the materialist paradox of the inside-out dichotomy, right? And it's still uncertain to me how Hume understands this or whether or not he actually identifies this paradox. So he, he talks about the impressions as if they arrive through the facilitators, right? The senses, as we would call them now. And possibly understands the colors as arriving and manifesting. But I wouldn't buy that one, right? But it's, it's hard to, you know, say something qualified about these aspects. But he is still sufficiently doubtful or skeptical about being very strict about saying these things. He says there are certain aspects here he would like to point to that it might be the case that sometimes you have an idea of, for instance, a particular shade of blue that you haven't experienced before. And then you, he says you can possibly experience a particular shade, that exotic shade that you haven't seen before, right? Without having actually, you can, there would, there's not all of a sudden blank. Oh, there's a something missing there because I haven't seen that color before, right? But it has to impress itself in order to be there. So maybe he is, he is counterproductive or, or, or going against his own statement because if it impresses itself, it needs to become an idea at the same time as it's being impressed. Otherwise, he would never get the impression, right? Or he would never get the idea if he never had the impression. So you should be able to impress certain aspects by its own accord there wouldn't be any blanks as such, right? Because they just impress. And then you create some ideas later, right? So the impressions can come and go as they please, basically. And I will have an idea of them, or I won't have an idea. I, I, I suppose that you would have an idea, right? Or at least some, something going on, right? It's not necessarily a memory of it, right? But an idea of it. So... Yes, um, fine. This exception, it may not be amiss to remark on this head that the principle of the priority of impressions to ideas must be understood with another limitation, 
namely, that as our ideas are images of our impressions, so we can form secondary ideas, which are images of the primary, as appears from this very reasoning concerning them. This is not, properly speaking, an exception to the rule, so much as an explanation of it. Ideas produce the images of themselves in new ideas, but as the first ideas are supposed to be derived from impressions, it still remains true that all our simple ideas proceed either immediately or immediately from their correspondent impressions. This, then, is the first principle I establish in the science of human nature nor ought we to despise it because of the simplicity of its appearance. For it is remarkable that the present question concerning the precedency of our impressions or ideas is the same with what has made so much noise in other terms when it has been disputed whether there be any innate ideas or whether all ideas be derived from sensation and reflection. Oh, we yeah. may observe yes, there's, he is paraphrasing or he is pointing to Locke, I would think here, right? But it, this goes way back to the Platonic forms and so on. This is as old as it gets, right? Where Locke had the idea of the blank slate and children are born with blank slates and then they impress these ideas into them so they can recognize a cow or whatever, right? I'm not strong on luck, but something like that, right? Uh, and when he says innate ideas, that would be sort of the platonic forms, something like that, right? Or uh, all ideas be derived from sensation and reflection. Um, be derived from sensation. Whether or not they are um, impressed as Hume would call it, uh, in the Lockean fashion, right? So this is sort of, do you know something before you're born? Or do you have, uh, maybe I should say, do you have access to any idea before you're born? Or are you born without ideas and need the impressions in order to get to the ideas? Interesting question. Hard to get to. Another thing that makes it even harder to get to is that I, for one, but from what I heard from other people, it's very hard to remember the the earliest childhood. There's very few memories, sort of sporadic things you might be able to remember. Maybe in, in the first five years of my life, I can maybe recall 10, 10 situations, maybe something like that. Maybe 20 if I dig hard enough, right? But... There seems to be a connection between establishing the first steps in your mind and your ability to remember what you experienced when you were a child. There might be other evolutionary aspects in in this for forgetting what you experienced as a child. I don't know. I, I'm not, you know, you can fab fabulate all you want, but it would be sometime back then that your your cognitive apparatus matures into however it works and that he's pointing a bit to that right so let maybe we should head into to the next bit he's talking about that in order to prove the ideas of extension and color not to be innate philosophers do nothing but shew that they are conveyed by our senses to prove the ideas of passion and desire not to be innate, they observe that we have a preceding experience of these emotions in ourselves. Now, if we carefully examine these arguments, we shall find that they prove nothing but that ideas are preceded by other, more lively perceptions from which they are derived and which they represent. I hope this clear stating of the question will remove all disputes concerning it and will render this principle of more use in our reasonings than it seems hitherto to have been. End of file three. So, 
That's that's interesting. That's interesting. Yes, he can, he he um, develops a general idea. He looks at it, compares it to how things have prior been established by philosophers. He points out general flaws in the thinking without maybe going as deep as I might like him to do. But he points at it and uh, he sort of he creates a bit of suspense. I would say right. It, I want to keep reading because there's something about it that he's going to reveal something later, I feel, right? Um, but this whole question of, of the blank slate or not, um, I am kind of a blank slate proponent, but in a different fashion than you might think. Um, when I say that a child is born with a blank slate, I would possibly agree I can never get to it, but I would possibly agree. But I would say the blankness is an aspect of the slate. Then there is a slate. It's blank, but there still is a slate. And the slate is sort of a placeholder for the idea that there's something that is completely geared towards establishing, uh, you know, creating impressions and establishing ideas, right? That's the slate that does it blank, but it becomes unblank as it's being used as a child. And you know, children, they like to crawl around and, you know, chase this, put it in the mouth and, you know, use their senses. And I guess this is a part of, you know, filling out the blank slate, right? <laughs> I'm just sort of, I'm riffing a bit here, right? It's sort of, you know, I don't care too much about this, right? Because it's... 50 going on 57 years back in my past maybe right so it doesn't really matter to me other than it should hold me back against going into all sorts of fabulations that i might not want to go into when i've sort of classified it this way right okay so um i think we'll stop it here because the section two is about division of the subject maybe i should check how long it is it's very short let's take this one also because we're only 27 minutes in um you know i have i'm in a bit of a momentum here so let me carry on <laughs> i maybe i could check i can see i can actually see the the timings here it's three minutes and five minutes okay i think we'll take this one and then call it a day right okay you're with me Okay, let, let's take the next one. File 4 of A Treatise of Human Nature by David Hume, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by George Yeager. Book 1, Part 1, Section 2, Division of the Subject. Since it appears that our simple impressions are prior to their correspondent ideas and that the exceptions are very rare, method seems to require we should examine our impressions before we consider our ideas. Impressions may be divided into two kinds, those of sensation and those of reflection. The first kind arises in the soul originally from unknown causes. The second is derived in a great measure from our ideas, and that in the following order. An impression first strikes upon the senses and makes us perceive heat or cold, thirst or hunger, pleasure or pain of some kind or other. Of this impression, there is a copy taken by the mind which remains after the impression ceases, and this we call an idea. This idea of pleasure or pain, when it returns upon the soul, produces the new impressions of desire and aversion, hope and fear, which may properly be called impressions of reflection because derived from it. These again are copied by the memory and imagination and become ideas, 
which perhaps in their turn give rise to other impressions and ideas. So that the impressions of reflection are only antecedent to their correspondent ideas, but posterior to those of sensation and derived from them. The examination of our sensations belongs more to anatomists and natural philosophers than to moral, and therefore shall not at present be entered upon. And as the impressions of reflection, namely, passions, desires, and emotions, which principally deserve our attention, arise mostly from ideas, it will be necessary to reverse that method which at first sight seems most natural, and in order to explain the nature and principles of the human mind, give a particular account of ideas before we proceed to impressions. For this reason, I have here chosen to begin with ideas. End of file four. Um, hmm. I don't exactly know what to say about this one. I'm not sure I understand uh, all of it. It seems to be a little modeled, uh, the, the differentiation now between impressions and ideas and the ideas following from ideas. And I would like a more strict and maybe more than a dichotomy of classifications here. At least that's what I would have. And you might want to check my video uh, called the structure of my metaphysics to have some idea how I would approach this, right? Um, but it's along the same line, it's the same algorithm or kind of method he's using to philosophize here. So the division of the subject, um, that's not the philosophy, that's more a reference to his dividing between ideas and impressions, and he has to talk about something before the other. And I'm not sure I understand why he needs to do this. Uh, maybe it's just the language that is so convoluted. Or, uh, that 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 I'm having a hard time understanding exactly what he means, but it, it see I didn't find anything that sounded sounded incorrect or anything like that. I'm just not sure I understand it. So I I think I will let this one pass because it see it sounds more like an argumentation for why he's going to do the next bit. So why don't we just jump into the next bit and see what he says hear what he says. File 5 of A Treatise of Human Nature by David Hume, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by George Yeager. Book 1, Part 1, Section 3 of the Ideas of the Memory and Imagination. We find by experience that when any impression has been present with the mind, it again makes its appearance there as an idea. And this it may do after two different ways. Either when in its new appearance it retains a considerable degree of its first vivacity and is somewhat intermediate betwixt an impression and an idea, or when it entirely loses that vivacity and is a perfect idea. The faculty by which we repeat our impressions in the first manner is called the memory, and the other the imagination. It is evident at first sight that the ideas of the memory are much more lively and strong than those of the imagination, and that the former faculty paints its objects in more distinct colors than any which are employed by the latter. When we remember any past event, the idea of it flows in upon the mind in a forcible manner, whereas in the imagination, the perception is faint and languid and cannot without difficulty be preserved by the mind steady and uniform for any considerable time. Here then is a sensible difference betwixt one species of ideas and another but of this more fully hereafter in part three, section five.
part two. There is another difference betwixt these two kinds of ideas, which is no less evident, namely that though neither the ideas of the memory nor imagination, neither the lively nor faint ideas can make their appearance in the mind unless their correspondent impressions have gone before to prepare the way for them. Yet the imagination is not restrained to the same order and form with the original impressions, while the memory is, in a manner, tied down in that respect, without any power of variation. It is evident that the memory preserves the original form in which its objects were presented, and that wherever we depart from it in recollecting anything, it proceeds from some defect or imperfection in that faculty. An historian may, perhaps, for the more convenient carrying on of his narration, relate an event before another to which it was, in fact, posterior. But then he takes notice of this disorder, if he be exact, and by that means replaces the idea in its due position. It is the same case in our recollection of those places and persons with which we were formerly acquainted. The chief exercise of the memory is not to preserve the simple ideas, but their order and position. In short, this principle is supported by such a number of common and vulgar phenomena that we may spare ourselves the trouble of insisting on it any further. The same evidence follows us in our second principle of the liberty of the imagination to transpose and change its ideas. The fables we meet with in poems and romances put this entirely out of the question. Nature there is totally confounded, and nothing mentioned but winged horses, fiery dragons, and monstrous giants. Nor will this liberty of the fancy appear strange when we consider that all our ideas are copied from our impressions, and that there are not any two impressions which are perfectly inseparable. Not to mention that this is an evident consequence of the division of ideas into simple and complex. Wherever the imagination perceives a difference among ideas, it can easily produce a separation. End of file five. Um. <laughs> I'm not sure what to see. Seems like he is sort of sowing the seeds for what is going to come um it's a little convoluted i am not sure i completely understand what he's trying to convey um he's mentioning memory and what is going on with an impression that can become an idea and the idea idea stored in the memory but they are also ordered in a certain time fashion where if you put it in front of the other, it is being put back in the right place. And so there is some sorting and, and traffic going on in the cognitive thing. And I, I'm completely on board with that, of course. Um, but it seems a little, it seems a little difficult to, to really decipher this. And, it seems also like something that is a preparation from something more elaborate later so that I would sort of carry it over and take care of it then, right? Um, so it's, it's sort of half-baked, this sort of introductory thing he's doing. So I would have liked it to be more clear and more direct and less sort of compli complicated or convoluted and I think there might be a little problem running into various aspects that should the the impressions and ideas are fine but there are certain impressions he's talking about that I would classify as something else rather than the saying that some impressions that are emotions I would rather say then there are impressions and then there's also something called emotions 
rather than calling emotions also some kind of repression. I know that it's it it's not something that it's usually something that you have a, an idea that is comes from outside your mind. Let's say put it this way, right? Um, because the ideas are sort of within the mind and sort of something like that, right? So that I understand his rationale for for doing it, but I think it's it can quickly become difficult to follow what he's trying to say when he has this, merely has this dichotomy of impressions and ideas. And it's also the way he he, he says it that ideas can follow from ideas. And, and so there are only these two terms, impressions and ideas, that can sort of describe everything foundationally. And it, that can be um, difficult to get a clear grasp on. So... Hopefully later uh, it will be clearer, and um, so far so good, right? I'm I'm basically uh, still on board with with Demi Hume, uh, as I would expect to be, and um, I think this is working pretty well. Uh, I I usually don't lose uh, connection with my, with the text. I usually am able to follow the text uh, along, following along with the with the audio and um, change the, the pages as, as we go along. And it, it seems to work fine, this. And, and if you agree with me, which I hope you do, um, I think we will carry on doing it this way. So have a nice day. See you in the next one.